So um, uh, today is a tribute um, to these three, uh, uh, four people out on the screen. Uh, Ballerstad, he's taught me a lot. And there are these three lovely uh, uh, women. Um, Nina Teicholz, who has wrote The Big Fat Surprise, and uh, Zoe Harcom from England, and Denise Minger. It's a young and budding uh, individual, and I'd like you at some point to search the internet after today. And I have invited all four of these people to come to our October seminar, which is going to be there at the University of Houston. So, um, um, I'm a shameless uh, leverager. Uh, it is, see, I, I move away from the microphone. In academia, it's called plagiarism, which is not good. Uh, so I wanted to start out this conference by using a tweet from one of my favorite guys, Sean Baker. He's an orthopedic surgeon who says, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a single food that tasted great, provided muscle gain and fat loss? So what do you think that food is? So that's meat, that's beef. There are a few issues with beef that we will discuss towards the end. And um, to that, Peter Ballastad is adding, adding this, this uh, sentence. It says, wouldn't it be amazing, wouldn't it be really amazing if there was a way to convert inedible, that means for humans, uh, material, for high quality food that humans can use. So high quality food would be uh, butter, meat and cheese. This belongs in good quality diet which would promote human health rather than the refined carbohydrates and sugars that we use. Using the portion of the earth's surface that cannot produce human utilizable food. So this is a, a depiction of the earth about two-thirds of that is water and as you can see out here um, a portion of that uh, is forage which is uh, land that grows grass and uh, then there is forest and then there is um, uh, dry land like uh, uh, d deserts and uh, deserts and uh, cultivatable lands and also where we live which is one percent so if we can utilize the uh, forageable land, the grassland, and at the same time improve the environment and improve human health, and would that, wouldn't that be amazing? So how could you do that? So the way you could do that is by using ruminants. So ruminants are animals like cows, goat, and sheep, and uh, deer and horses. And uh, as humans, we've had a long-standing relationship with ruminants. This is a, a skeleton of the uh, ancient uh, bull, which is called the Mounted Auric. It's in a museum in Denmark. And uh, to the right of the screen is, uh, an, uh, is a painting from one of the caves, which is 20,000 years old, of a bull. So amazingly absent from uh, this museum is the painting of the sacred soybean plant. <laughs> so back in the 1970s, uh, the McGowan, the McGowan Committee, which was deciding human nutrition in the United States uh, with the USDA, decided that humans are getting heart disease because they're eating saturated fat and animal food and that animal food production, I mean, sorry, animal food consumption should be reduced. And so this committee was formed, this uh, huge manuscript, which you see out there called Human Nutrition was put out. And at that time, there was a lot of controversy. There were many people who were coming and saying, hey, what you're doing is really wrong for human health. And come on in, Mr. Chatham. No, no, we, we, we uh, appreciate it. I have, Mr. Chatham is somebody I have learned a lot from and, 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 and uh, he is here uh, almost all the time. But anyway, what we were saying is that there were people who were saying to the McGowan committee that what you are doing is really wrong for human health and one of them was Peter Cleaves. 
and he said for a modern disease to be related to an old-fashioned food example red meat that is modern disease meaning heart disease cancers dementia is one of the most ludicrous things he has heard in his life and I think today I want to prove that he was right so let me put out this question to you guys because I don't want you to sleep what is the most abundant food if I were to ask you what is the organic material that is most abundant in the world greens excellent so forage which is grass is the most abundant organic material there is there in the world and that is basically what ruminants eat so what is fiber made up of do you guys ever know what fiber is made up of correct cellulose so cellulose is made up of amazingly enough if you bond molecules of sugar which is glucose in a specific way you get cellulose so this is bonding of the glucose molecules in one particular way and it forms this thick fibrous strand which is called cellulose and the question that comes it comes about is that many of you are so intent on eating a lot of fiber fiber is cellulose so my question to you is that can humans have any enzymes that they produce that can metabolize cellulose hey mr jacob How are you? come on in sir yes sir so no the answer is that no only microbes can do that on the other hand um, so the most abundant uh, carbohydrate in the world is cellulose but on the other hand if you take the same glucose and you bond it in a different way it becomes a tubular structure and that is starch which humans can use to some degree so what is the organism that is not or what is the mammal that is not competitive with humans that can use food stuff that we cannot use and make human usable food and that is a ruminant and the reason they do that is because unlike us they are not monogastric humans are monogastric we have one stomach our digestion is based on acid their digestion is based on fermentation which is done by bacteria so they have a rumen which is pointed out here and then the rumen takes the material the about the hundred pounds of material that the cow a mature cow will put into itself and it will break it down constantly by chewing as well as the movement in the rumen where the bacteria act on it the bacteria act on the fiber that this ruminant is eating so it, it, it eats it it goes out and does the best which is called rumination and it produces what it is breaking down fiber to produce what so energy is correct what it is doing is it's breaking down fiber to produce fat because the microbes turn the fiber into short chain fatty acids and that is through which the animal gets fat and bigger and produces milk and and meat that we can utilize now it does have an acid based stomach too which you see at the end but that stomach is not as functional in the ruminant as it is there in the humans so here is a New Zealand uh, uh, picture picture from New Zealand in which you're showing that there's about 15 kilograms of dry matter so a little over 35 pounds that the cow can take in through tongue work it doesn't have opposable thumbs and it takes in that dry matter and converts it into about five and three tenths pound of milk solids so it produces um, milk fat lactose and about 25 percent protein so about 30 30 percent of milk fat and lactose and of our 25 percent protein so here is an important slide for you it says <laughs> I can turn what is your superpower and another slide out here which says that I can turn grass into steaks and you know what is your superpower too okay 
So I said I'm a shameless leverager. I, I get slides from people because I want you guys to learn. So here is a quiz. Which mammals are designed to digest a low-fat diet? So which amongst these? So the first group is sheep, cows, and mountain gorillas. And the second group is uh, Maasai man who eats uh, a different diet, the modern man. You see how muscular and strong he is. Lions and a domesticated German shepherd or domesticated dogs. So who can, who can digest a low fat diet? The top group or the bottom group? Excellent, you guys know it all. Okay, so the reason for that is that, let's say take a mountain gorilla. So the mountain gorilla has what we call as post gastric fermentation. The mountain gorilla also has a single stomach. But unlike us, and I'm going to have to step up here to show this to you, um, it has this fermenting vat which comes after the small intestines and this is called the cecum. Our cecum is rudimentary, it's very small. So we have no capacity to, to ferment, but the mountain gorilla can eat a herbivorous diet, a plant-based diet, and can get some calories from fermentation which humans cannot do. So these are called hindgut fermenters. Now, there is a problem with hindgut fermentation because you don't absorb certain very important vitamins like B12 and K2. These are vitamins that we recommend that you take. And thus, mountain gorillas have this very interesting practice that I all want you to look up sometime later, which is called cop coprophagy, okay? so. I won't get into details about that, but I just want to tell you that the next time your vegan friend tells you that eat like a mountain gorilla, you should say, no thank you. So um, uh, Seth Meyers told me that that joke will get a standing ovation. I'm just kidding. So. Um, I put this slide in uh, specifically uh, for Dr. John Burns. Uh, I, I know that he and I are both Kennedy fans. So this is uh, J John F. Kennedy saying, the great enemy of truth is not often the lie, the deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. So the reason I put this up is because there are forces that tell you that eating a plant-based diet is good for you. So, but I can tell you that nutrition research does not support that vegetarian diets are better or healthier than human for humans than animal-based diet. And um, this is a history lesson also for you guys. Uh, can any of you guys recognize who that person is? So the advent of vegetarian, ve vegetarian diet starts in the mid 19th centuries in the United States and it relates to this one particular individual and if I tell you his name you would immediately recognize it's uh, no other than John Harvey Kellogg because John Harvey Kellogg uh, believed that eating animal food makes women lustful harpies. I'm not exactly sure what is wrong with that, but. <laughs> so he's the inventor of cornflakes and he's promoted this vegetarian ideal since the mid 19th century. You also see Dean Ornish and this other gentleman here is David L. Katz. And the reason I put out David L. Katz is because He's a very strong proponent of reducing saturated fat and animal food in your diet. And uh, he's written books and like Dr. Uh, Burns was saying, he has come on Mehmet Oz and I hope I never have to go on Mehmet Oz because I don't agree with him. Uh, but uh, I singled him out, uh, I took a slide from Nina Taisho, singled him out because this is what Dr. Katz is. He has been paid over a quarter of a million dollars from Hershey Corporation making sugar. Uh, he works for several cereal, cereal manufacturers, Quaker Oats. He works for the Sugar Corporation to defend them in lawsuits. 
So, and then he also works for kind bars, which may not be as bad, but uh, I want to tell you that there is definitely some bias. So, let's say you are a vegan, and you know, I don't want, my knowledge is incomplete, I, I don't want to put down anybody, uh, I want to say that I would be the first to say I don't understand everything, but we, being a vegan is probably better than eating the standard American diet because standard American diet is high in grains, added sugar and vegetable oils. So if you're a vegan and you're eating plant sources from a variety of plants, uh, so you're getting uh, protein from walnuts, from um, flax seeds, from hemp seeds, from chia seeds and you're eating some other vegetable matters along with the fruit, you got to understand that plant food has a lot of anti-nutrients. There are phytic acids and lectins that prevent absorption of protein and calcium. In addition to that, if you are a vegan, you better take some supplements because vegan diet does not have the important omega-3 which is the DHA and EPA. It doesn't have B12, it doesn't have iron, it doesn't have K2, it doesn't have many of the important minerals because bioavailability of that is not as good. So um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you is that animal protein is superior to plant protein. So the concept that all proteins are of comparable nutritional value should be rejected by us. And the reason is I point out here you take 100 grams of beef and 100 grams of pinto beans and you see how much protein it is and you will say, hey, the, the pinto beans actually have a little more protein than the beef. But you take this thing about human digestion being based on gastric acid, so acid digests the protein and because of presence of anti-nutrients, what is digestible is much better in beef than it is there in the pinto beans. So you know you see that it, it's already fallen from 20 to 17. And then there is something called biologic value of the protein. Biologic value of the protein is dependent on the kind of amino acid it has. So in other words, humans need certain essential amino acids. You know, there is not an essential carbohydrate. You, you can go without eating any carbs. But you cannot go without eating complete protein because we don't make some of the amino acids that we need for even for brain function. There are, neuro, there are neurotransmitters that our brain uses and the precursors of that, uh, tyrosine and phenylalanine, come from proteins and we can't make that. So when you look at the biologic value, you see that the biologic value is roughly a third of that of the animal protein and of course the plant protein is not complete protein because it doesn't supply you with all the essential amino acids. So if you are a plant based person you better eat protein from a variety of sources. Okay so the other thing that you hear in the public realm in other words if you go and poll a hundred physicians they will say that saturated animal fat causes heart disease. But I'd like to submit to you that that hypothesis has been refuted. There's another hypothesis that is popularized that dietary cholesterol causes heart disease and it was promoted by the diet heart hypothesis or the lipid heart hypothesis and I think that there were commercial interests that promoted that and Many people will tell you, many of the physicians will tell you if you eat a diet that is high in saturated fat and cholesterol, you will get diabetes, cancers, heart disease and dementia. Haven't you heard that? Or Okay. So um, I have used some of these slides before. This is, uh, at the bottom is France. Damn the French. They look very good. Yet they eat the maximum amount of fat. If you look at it, they're 15.5% is saturated fat. But you go up to the top, these are the Eastern European countries, and these people eat a lot less saturated fat because they're not as affluent. And you can see that cholesterol levels in those French people with eating all that fat is actually high. But if you come into this column, which is out here, 
you can see that the death rate per 100,000 people from heart disease is much lower in the French. So the French smoke a lot, eat a lot of fat, yet they look good, they don't get obese and they don't die. <laughs> and um, this is some similar information from uh, the Monica project that is telling you that uh, Sweden, Italy and France eat a lot of fat but yet when you look at the death rate, uh, their death rate will be showing in white which is a lower death rate than other countries that are eating less fat. So if you look at epidemiologic data you would find that uh, fat consumption is actually associated with lower risk of having heart disease and mortality. All right, now this is one of my favorite slides and I took a long time to prepare it. How many of you believe that fasting, not eating is good for you? So uh, that's great. So how many of you would believe me if I tell you that fasting raises your bad cholesterol? Your LDL cholesterol goes up when you fast. So very few people, right? So LDL cholesterol is much maligned. But if I were to ask you, if you stopped eating for, you know, let's say, for seven days, and, and it's easily possible, you can drink water and salt and stop eating for seven days and you will do fine, even though many of you may not believe it. But let's say you stopped eating, how long do you think your carbohydrate reserves will be there? How long, how long will it take before you run out of the carbs that your body is storing? So your body can store no more than about half a day worth of carbohydrate. After your carbohydrates have run out, you have to burn fat. You have to burn fat. How does your body transport fat in the bloodstream? So exactly right, it transports it as the LDL molecule. How many physicians would know that the LDL molecule's primary function is to supply energy to the cells? almost less than a few percent of the physicians. Because we've been so ingrained to think that LDL is bad. So in this study, people who fasted for seven days, the average increase in their cholesterol, in their LDL cholesterol was 70%. Okay, so uh, I have a very nice YouTube seminar which talks about the benefits of having high LDL. I highly encourage you to look at that. Okay, so here I am pretty much walking on water. You know, I'm not very comfortable because I'm outside my comfort zone. Uh, and so I'd like you to be a little kind on me if you know more than I do. But um, one of the arguments that's coming out is that, hey, we want you, we will submit to you that eating an animal-based diet is actually good, but that you need to eat for the planet. And if you need to eat for the planet because animal-based agriculture uses a lot of water, there's a lot of carbon dioxide, you should not eat animals. Okay, so this is a common argument. So, let me see if I can try to dispel that because I would like Peter Ballerstadt to come here and dispel this for you. But all life on Earth is cycling of carbon dioxide, is cycling of carbon. So there are these uh, plants that can use photosynthesis, they can use uh, radiant energy from the sun, uh, radiant energy comes down and these photoautotropic organisms, which is plants, can use water and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and convert that in the presence of sunlight to carbohydrates which is fiber in the case of forage and plants use I mean animals use that carbohydrate they eat the carbohydrate and they expel out carbon dioxide so it's a natural cycling car there's a natural carbon cycling if I were to reach out magically and remove roughly 40% of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, plants will cease to grow and we would have no food to eat. So the cycling of carbon dioxide is absolutely essential. So what Dr. Ballerstadt talks about is that 
you have to manage your forage land, your grassland properly. So out here is young pasture land that is shown in the uh, top right and you can see that it is young and you should not graze it at that level. Just below that is well-grown pasture land, the grass is grown up and the difference in age between them is just like three weeks, 21 days. And you should let the animals graze on that but not overgraze. And you see on the top left hand side is grazed land which has not been overgrazed. Now what would happen to the land if you just did not use it at all? If you just left it out there to rot? So it goes senescent, it doesn't contribute to the carbon cycle. And is it of any use to humans? Can humans use that type of carbohydrate or cellulose? We can't. So here is a depiction that I got which shows that uh, if you overgraze pasture land, there are not a root system that is left. Whereas if you manage it properly and you let it grow before you start grazing, there is a huge root system that is capturing carbon from the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and putting it into the soil. So here is a trick question. What is better at recycling carbon from the atmosphere? Is it a similar acreage of sequoia forest or is it a similar acreage of mature pasture land? So at least Dr. Ballerstadt says that's what it is and the reason is is that mature pasture land has a lot of root system that is capturing carbon from the atmosphere and if you look at well managed pasture land you see that out here this is about 40 inches below the surface all of this area is black and why is it black it's black because carbon is black have you ever seen a cycle a carbon cycle that has not been painted it's all black all right, so this is a picture of Serengeti. There is animal Serengetis in Tanzania and Kenya border and there is herd out there and the herds are in constant motion because if they stayed in one place, they would not have enough to eat. So if you look at a diagram of their movement, you can see that they move between the countries and the reason they move is because they want to prevent themselves from being killed by the predators. So there is a natural movement and so this natural cycle manages the pasture land for the herds in Serengeti. And modern farmers are figuring out doing the same thing to pasture land. All right, now I'm ashamed to say that I stood here in the diet seminar several years ago and I said, Grass-fed beef is something that you guys should have because it has got a lot of omega-3, it is good for you. And several of my patients came back and chastised me saying that it is so expensive doc that I had to stop buying medicines, uh, it was really bad for me. And I want to submit to you that I was wrong and I'll tell you here why. Now contrary to popular belief, most of the cattle that we use, that is the beef, the amount of food stuff they get is about 83% from grass and only about 17% comes from non-human utilizable grains and vegetable waste matter. However, when they are moved to the finishing stage into the CAFOs, you reverse that ratio as you can see out here. Um, the ratio is reversed uh, in which most of it is grain and very little of that is uh, from grass. However, if you want to be environmentally friendly, you should go towards ruminants because almost all of your fowl, your, your hens, your turkey and all, as well as your swine are raised on feed that contains grain and because they cannot utilize grass, they don't have fermentation like the ruminants do as I show out here because 100% of their food stuff is coming from grains. Um, so if you look at the meat supply of the world, uh, somehow for whatever reasons we are preferring chicken and pork meat and 25% uh, of our meat supply is cattle and I think we should consider increasing that. Now there are other ways in which you can improve 
uh, the environment. Here is the world's population of cattle and you will see that the US is about 12%, uh, you see that uh, Europe is about 12%. India is a little higher. South America, I was surprised to see, is about 23, 24 percent. But when you look at the yield, when you look at how much these cattle are producing, you can see that roughly half the milk supply comes from Europe. So Europeans somehow have figured out a way of efficiently growing cattle and producing both higher amount of milk as well as meat even compared to Americans. So we are not as good as the Europeans are. All right, now I said that um, I'm going to talk about red meat and cancers. About 2012, the study came out. There were two studies, long-term studies, uh, which was, uh, one was a study for men and another one was the nurses' health study. Together, they had over 70,000 patients. And it was said that red meat consumption is associated with increased risks of heart disease as well as cancer mortality. And if you see out here, uh, I have expanded that, they said that the relative increase in risk was about 13%. So 13% increased risks of getting cancers and heart disease if you consumed red and processed meat. So it was a study that went on for about 28 years and every four years you would be given a questionnaire. So this is called a food frequency questionnaire. So I put that up there. That's how on the basis of that they tried to determine who was eating more meat. And if you take the food frequency questionnaire and you expand it, it says how often in the past three months did you eat the following? Okay, I have trouble remembering what I ate two days ago. <laughs> how often, how many times, in the last three months and you get that questionnaire once every four months. So the Harvard School of Public Health get, collects this information, it collects garbage and puts out garbage. Um, so when you talk about relative risk, that means you're saying by eating and not eating how much do you increase your risk from a statistical perspective and if the relative risk is less than two percent it could just be noise. So just take it from me. If you take the same relative risk of smoking or non-smoking, that relative risk is 15 to 20, not 1.13. But let's say we give them that relative risk. So most people who consume red meat are not like you. I mean, you guys are converts, low carb converts, and you eat red meat for a specific purpose. You avoid carbohydrates, you have a healthy lifestyle, you don't smoke, you exercise, you take the vitamins that I recommend, but when you looked at this study, the people who ate the most red meat were doing all the wrong things in life. Smoking more, exercising less, and not taking the vitamins that we recommend. And here is where Denise Minger comes in and she collected this data. So what is shown out here is that this is, the, the, the blue bars are the lowest quartile. What that means is that these are the group of people who are eating the least amount of red meat, which is out here. You can see just 0.22. And this one is the highest quartile, which means the top 20% that is eating the highest amount of meat. And when you compare them across the board, the people who ate less meat were more physically active, smoked less, and used more vitamins in both the health professional studies and the nurses study, including about 78 plus thousand patients. And that's Denise Minger. And one very important thing that she points out is that the lowest quartile group, which is eating the least amount of red meat, had higher cholesterol levels. Go figure that. They say red meat causes increase in cholesterol, but here it's the exact opposite. So, these two women, they took all this data, they put it together, they analyzed it properly, and I'd like to read out to you what Zoe Harcom says about it, because the numbers were very small. The overall risk of dying in this group was not even one person in 100 years over a 28-year study. If death rate is very small, a slightly higher death rate in certain circumstances is still very small. So in other words, if you went from 1 to 1.13 percent, 
1 to 1.13 percent that's just statistical noise and what you're not accounting for is that people who eat red meat as burgers as hot dogs are actually eating white bread ketchup they're eating it with, with they're drinking it with soft drinks what is the contribution of that to the mortality is unclear now there are physicians that work at this hospital that refuse to eat red meat because it, they think that it increases colorectal cancer so here is a study that was funded by the NIH four and eight year follow-up 2,000 patients the red meat consumption was reduced in this group what do you think happened to colon cancer rate was it any different it was not so the polyps that turned cancerous was the same in both groups um, this is the women women's health study 49,000 patients asked to reduce their red meat consumption was reduced by about 20 percent and when you look at cancer mortality from colon cancer exactly the same all right now we should find some common ground and the reason we should find common ground is that not what all we do is right as far as meat is concerned and here is where I need help from Chana and other people and uh, what I just realized is that I'm speaking a little slowly because I want you wanted to have impact and I thought that I would have time to talk about vegetable oils but I will talk about them only if a question comes up and I'll cut it short before that but I want to spend some time on this section because I want people like David uh, and Chana and somebody else to come up and help me come up with recipes that will improve the quality of our animal food so if you go to an American aisle American grocery store and look at a, a meat supply you'll find rows and rows of muscle meat that's it rows and rows of muscle meat so muscle meat contains methionine so you know recently have started checking homocysteine levels in you I know Shalini you have seen me check homocysteine where is Nina I don't know which maybe she's gone but homocysteine <laughs> is something that increases the coagulation of blood it makes the blood thicker high homocysteine levels are associated with strokes and heart attacks and muscle meat is very high in homocysteine and some of us cannot metabolize the homocysteine and get rid of it because some of it gets converted from methionine into homocysteine there are mechanisms that our body has to get rid of the homocysteine but many of them are lacking especially if you're deficient in vitamin b12 b6 and folic acid so if you have heard about rats you know there were experiments done in rats in which they took the rats and they gave them half the amount of food that they would usually give so took rats gave them half the amount of food do you think that they lived longer or shorter so they lived about 50 percent longer now they did the same experiments with methionine and found that methionine duplicates the effect of calorie restriction so eating muscle meat is not as good whereas eating other amino acids that come from other parts of the animal such as glycine would reduce the damaging effects of methionine at least in some animal studies and glycine is found in gelatin in, in cow feet and I'll get into the cow feet in a little bit bone broth and other other areas so um, this is a this is a polar plot, plot map and polar plot map I need to explain to you out here they take a food group these are all the vitamins out here this they consider the bad stuff the sodium the cholesterol and the saturated fat and you all know that that is not the bad stuff right okay and these are minerals so if you take muscle meat which is up here muscle meat is not very good source of vitamins not that great a source of different minerals but if you go to brain you see that hey you're getting more uh, vitamins and getting more minerals and of course you're getting all this good stuff also with that but when you go to beef liver and beef kidney man these are extremely rich sources of not only vitamins but also of minerals so um, here is a little quiz for you guys 
animal parts we have forgotten in our Puritan way of eating. <laughs> and Chana and David and Nina are going to help me make recipes of these. So, uh, do you guys recognize that? So, liver. Okay. What about these things? Let's see if you can recognize this and this. Tongue and feet. Okay, good. I mean, here, here is the, here's the list. Okay, I'm going to tell you uh, that where I come from, the town of Hyderabad, they make one of the best dish possible, which is called the paya. Paya means feet of uh, goat and, and, and uh, cows. And if you go on Highway 3 to Salatin, there's a restaurant called Tempura Salatin. They make some of the best cow feet dish. The uh, Highway 6, I mean sorry, Highway 3 and uh, help me with that uh, where Dr. Bala's office is. No, not Nasa Road 1, it's towards uh, just before Beltway 8. Uh, I think somebody will look it up. Uh, Scarsdale, yes, exactly. Okay. Now, my town, the town of Hyderabad, takes a tongue and makes a delectable beef nahari. Now, uh, David, Chana, you're going to go back to these food stuff and go ahead and tell me how we can create a recipe so that we can help the rest of the world. Okay. So, I want to kind of quickly go about some of the problems with meat. Cooking meat at high temperature may have problems because you generate some heterocyclic am amines. These are not good chemicals. And they form when you heat meat in open flame at 300 degrees. And it creates complexes of different molecules that may not be good for you. In addition, there's another thing called PAH, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And this happens when the juice from the meat falls onto the open flame and then ignites and comes back and coats the meat. So um, charred meat will also have PAH. So what you should do, and these are solutions I got from Denise Binger is that, and, and we recommend a lot of this, is that you should do slow cooking. Slow cooking is very good for us as we get older because as we get older, we don't digest protein as well. Can anybody tell me why we don't digest protein as well as we get older? Lack of hydrochloric acid. Yes, your hydrochloric acid levels go down. So as you get older, if you want to remain strong and vital, uh, with have the vitality of a young man, get familiar with a slow cooker. <coughs> My son, who is 20, the sous vide, I, I have nev no idea how to do it, but sous vide is another form of uh, cooking. I see Stacy nodding her head about out there. Cut off charred uh, stuff from your food. Another thing is to create marinades. Marinades are, uh, after you cook, soak the meat in olive oil, in um, lemon juice, in apple cider vinegar, so that you can get rid of these uh, polycy polycyclic hydrocarbons. And uh, pre-cook your food uh, in a slow cooker uh, so that you are exposing them to flames as little as possible. All right. Um, by the way, if somebody is interested in these slides, I want you guys to collect an email on piece of paper. I will mail you these slides. Okay, you don't have to take pictures and stuff like that. Okay, uh, real quickly, uh, real quickly because I want to have question and answers at the end. What about hormones in meat? Is Hormone pellets injected into the animals an important source of or hormones in the muscle or organ meats? The answer is no. Because you can see out here that if you want to get estrogens, if you want to get estrogens, the best way to get estrogens is by eating tofu and pinto beans and soy products. Because the amount of estrogens is very high, whereas if you implant the steer, the amount of estrogens in muscle is just minuscule higher than what is there in the non-implanted steer. And this is another picture that is showing you that tofu and all have much higher levels of estrogens than implanted or non-implanted beef. I was very guilty of this. I stood here and said, meat 
grass-fed meat is an important source of omega-3 so that's why omega-3 it's good for you to eat that so if you look at this slide this slide is popularized by people who want to promote that concept my situation is evolving because I keep learning by uh, coming here and teaching you guys what you see out here is that this is this 4 to 1 ratio uh, Harvard School of Public Health says that you you should have a 4 to 1 ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 grass-fed meat is better because the ratio is less than 4 grain-fed meat is bad because the ratio is over 4 and they say even soybean oil is not too bad compared to uh, some of the steaks and to chicken and 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 uh, pork so look at that slide and see how misleading it is when you look at the second slide and this slide tells you that ruminant meat or any meat is not an important source of either omega-3 or omega-6 so in other words if you're talking about omega-3 and omega-6 you get so little from either grain fed or grass fed and if you really want to have high levels of omega-3 you need to either eat the fish even farmed fish farmed salmon has high amounts of omega-3 um, compared to any of the other food stuff or you should take the omega-3 pill that we say you should take when you come to our office what is the best way to overload on omega-6 which is the inflammatory oil vegetables. is vegetables matter so vegetable oils including people who are overdosing on nuts let's say you decide hey I want to be eating a lot of nuts because it's good you are overdosing on omega-6 because nuts even uh, walnuts have high amounts of omega-6 so the problem may not be grain-fed cattle because grain-fed meat is a little cheaper it is mostly grain-fed people <laughs> um, I'll skip this slide uh, and uh, I'll just go through this one slide they the ruminants are a very natural detoxing mechanism for us because plant food is filled with toxins that our bodies don't use well there are alkaloids there are aromatic carboxylic acids there are phenols in plants that the animal eats detoxifies and their meat does not contain those uh, anti or anti nutrients as they are called um, I'm going to reserve the story of vegetable oils this is Nina Teicholz talking about vegetable oils It's a beautiful presentation I want you to all experience that in person when you come to our diet seminar but I want to close by using a quote from Mr. Bal uh, Dr. Ballerstad from whom I've learned a lot we human beings have a long relationship with ruminants we did not evolve to eat meat but we evolved because we ate meat we are where we are because we ate meat and also because as humans we learn to cook chop ferment grind and process meat because many people come and tell me we don't have the dental structure to eat meat so we uh, evolved as herbivores and I say no that's wrong we do have canine and we didn't need the dental structure to eat meat because as humans we could do all these post-processing things that other animals cannot do all right so in summary this is what we talked about today that forage agriculture that is eating ruminant meat is green that cellulose is the largest organic matter in the world that we cannot use and we should not let it go waste uh, humans lack the enzyme human digestion is acid based not fermentation based so fiber is not an important component of our diet animal sourced food is high quality and complete unlike plant based so, uh, food omega 6 to omega 3 meat is not an important source so you should not make the decision of whether you want to get grass fed or grain fed just rule go by your pocketbook animals detoxify plant chemicals meal uh, or meat preparation methods need to be explored Chana and David and Nina are going to help us with that and red and processed meat cause cancer heart disease is a lot of baloney <laughs> so let me finish quickly uh, this is uh, the October seminar 25th to 27th I want you guys to all take a picture of this and promote it uh, there are very good uh, program directors um, 
Uh, I'm going to get Peter Ballerstad. I'm going to get uh, the uh, Swedish diet doctor, Andrea Seinfeld. Jeff Gerber is going to be there. Uh, uh, Cummins, uh, Feldman. People who know all about low carb because low carb is not just what I teach out here. It's so much more. Um, next month, please mark your calendars. Uh, David Ka uh, Casabier um, and uh, Larry Diamond are going to talk about uh, public health policy, how we can influence public health policy because one of the things that I'm scared about after watching Nina, Tycho, Nina Tyshore's presentation is that when you eat at any restaurant, every single preparation method uses vegetable oils. And if you ask a question, I'll talk about the dangers of vegetable oils. And then next month, yeah, next month, June, uh, is KetoCon, uh, where uh, I'm going to be there in Austin giving presentations. It's a good seminar. It's a little expensive. But I advise you to consider it if you're going to be in the Austin area. Uh, the dates of, the, uh, of that are already there. And um, now I'm here. Uh, I went about five minutes over. I apologize. So uh, whatever questions you have, I will answer. I will stay back here. My people are very smart. Uh, they can answer your questions individually also. John, yeah. you want to come up here? At least one question for Dr. Burns, please. To keep it simple. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Eat, if I were to eat one thing once a week, what should I eat? Uh, good or bad? No, I want to. No, good. On the Ali diet, I want to. On, uh, I'm a I, I, I would say that a meat-based diet is probably the best diet you can have. Okay. Every day. Every day. Every day. Um, if you can learn how to cook meat without getting some of the uh, heterocyclic amines, that would be good. But even regardless of, let's say you cook just the usual way, a meat-based diet is probably going to provide you the single biggest vitality that you can think about. Now, is it, should I do it rare, medium rare, medium, what's the best? So, uh, depends, depends on how old you are, okay? So, if you're young, you can eat raw meat because you're, you have stomach acid that can di digest it. If you're older, if you have poor uh, nutrition, then I keep advising my patients that you should cook your meat so that the protein is digested outside your body and so you can absorb it easier. There's another thing that I advise, especially to people who have had gastric surgery, gastric uh, bypass surgery or gastric sleep, which is, when should you eat the protein part of your meal? Somebody said first? Yes. Eat the protein part of your meal first, because that's when you will digest it. Because you need stomach acid for that. You had a question at the back, sir? Uh, it might be a little unfair to ask if you shot from a health history, but uh, I was on keto last year for a while, and I was on a Should I take oh, yeah, yeah, please, yeah. So um, your situation may be very different. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, is the biggest, single biggest cause of cirrhosis in this country. And it's all as a result of a carbohydrate heavy diet. The way to burn fat is by not eating carbohydrate. If you give the body a choice between burning carbs and burning fat, it will always choose carbs. I have a number of patients in my practice in whom fatty liver disease has improved by going on a low carb diet. So your situation may be unique, you may have certain issues that may be different. So I cannot comment on that, you may need to go to a hepatologist who specializes in that. But NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is best treated with a low carb diet. Go ahead. So uh, my preference is ruminant meat. Ruminant meat is uh, beef uh, and other cattle, sheep, goat, and stuff like that. 
Um, I think that uh, the other meats are probably very good, like bacon is good, and chicken is good, much better than vegetable matters. Turkey would be okay too. I want, I want one question for Dr. Burns, please. Ask him a question about the conference. Ask him something about the grant. That should be something about President Kennedy. <laughs> I, I've read every biography there is. Because my parents were Irish immigrants, so I grew up with There are three pictures in my mail piece when I was growing up. Uh, Jesus, the Pope, and Kennedy. And, uh, not necessarily in that order. Uh, what did you think about the quote uh, that I used from? I, I, I hadn't heard that one, Dr. Lee. I hadn't heard that one. I, I'm glad. I knew most of them, but that's... That was a good one. Gene uh, Irish, can you recommend some good butter? Some butter, oh boy, yeah. Oh, boy, I, I, actually I don't think I can. I, I defer to the expert right here. <laughs> well, Nina, what Nina is driving at is that Kerrygold butter comes from Ireland, from your country. Oh, it's yes. grass-fed grass -fed butter and it's, it's good for all of yes, us. I should know that. My parents were from Cork. Maybe there's grass-fed butter in Cork. Any, any questions about, uh, yeah, anybody? So, uh, uh, this diet has been used in pregnancy by several people who are pioneer, pioneers in that, but I would not recommend it without monitoring and, and follow up and following with a knowledgeable person and also get your OB involved in it. And if your OB says yes, do it. But otherwise, I would say as a pregnant woman, you have enough trouble already, eat what you like. Uh, don't, don't worry about it, we can do that later. Yeah, go ahead, please. So that's a difficult question. It's a little out of my wheelhouse. Diverticulitis, what do I recommend? Um, so uh, my position on fiber has evolved like I have told you know before I even have a video YouTube video that talks about a fat and fiber salad I'm sorry I put that up I've not taken it out but I don't think fiber is an important uh, component of human diet and I think there is some studies that they s that say that it can worsen diverticulitis especially fiber from nuts and all that so as long as you're going on an animal-based diet and if it makes your diverticulitis quiescent, I would say that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Sid. Uh, what inflammation parameters do you want to follow in your Well, I think I'm obviously following Dr. Lee's lead here that this, uh, this notion of a bio, uh, biometric uh, risk index. So you're measuring a lot of biomarkers and, and, uh, for inflammation and, um, and uh, some blood, blood markers to, to create an index uh, to, to try to predict, have a, a predictive model for chronic disease. Maybe Dr. Ali yeah. can elaborate. Yeah, I, I, I want the expert on inflammation to come here and give you some information. Come on, Shalini, I want you to come and talk about what are the markers we check for inflammation. Because she can look at that inflammation marker and say, hey man, this guy is very low risk of having heart disease. Usually we check for uh, blood work, uh, CRP, C-reactive protein, that is a marker for inflammation and as you know, we all repeat, you know, inflammation is one of the highest risk factor for heart disease. Also we check for GGT, um, GGT again is found in, um, it's because of poor nutrition um, or you know, too high carbs and it will affect the liver and uh, that's when GGT levels get elevated. Next, also we check for ferritin. Ferritin again, ferritin is needed for uh, blood production. So again, when those numbers are elevated again, that means there is high carb, it is affecting the liver, so ferritin slowly gets leaked into the blood bloodstream. So that's good. And, and, and let's be clear, this is a University of Houston research project, uh, which is led by Dr. Ali, and uh, my involvement is only to the degree that I because um, I like the Dr. Ali diet, okay, so I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm just a chief, chief medical officer here and hope to uh, learn. But without Dr. Burns, we're getting no grant and no research fellow working on it, so <laughs> big round for him. <laughs> you had a question? No. Sharon, go ahead. As the uh, chief medical officer, what moves can you make to change the diet <laughs> 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 what is 
Clear Lake Cuisine. Uh, yes. Uh, That's a good question. I had a chat with uh, the Chief Operating Officer, Matt Matthias, about that. Uh, he's in charge of all that. I think it's, um, gosh, it's just an American diet, isn't it, Dr. Lee? I mean, it's just a, uh, and I, it's, it's just. Can you work on stopping using vegetable oils? Yeah, I think we can have a broader spectrum. I think this, this is not just a clear like problem, it's a hospital food in general. No, I mean, you know, I was, I was in the apartment business before I was in CMO, and I'd go by my, uh, my patient's drones and there'd be, uh, well, actually now on this day, I mean, all this stuff that was not recommended before, the eggs and bacon and so forth, and, and uh, I don't know if the hospital was necessarily following um, the diet that was ordered by the doctor. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, how does the ketogenic diet help leaky gut syndrome, which they tell me everybody has that to some degree. So I wanted to ask your opinion on that. So. Uh, that's that's such, a, such, such a great question. So um, if you go and you tell your doctor that, hey, I may have leaky gut, they'll roll their eyes and they'll say, you know, you're talking some baloney. Yeah. But uh, uh, the bacteria in your stomach feed on carbohydrates. One of the primary purposes of stomach acid is to kill the bacteria in the food that you eat. So if the bacteria in your food that you eat are not killed by the stomach acid, and they are not killed if you are eating a lot of carbs because bacteria prefer carbs preferentially, then what would happen is that you get SIBO, which is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And that increases the permeability of your intestines. What that means is that things can leak into the bloodstream. Our body does not like to see foreign protein. Our body likes to burn, uh, to break down protein to its amino acid, basic components, and then absorb the amino acid. It does not want to absorb foreign protein. And when it absorbs foreign protein, it can mount an inflammatory response and that can cause Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, it can lead to psoriasis, it can lead to type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis. So there are a whole host of different conditions. Do you know that roughly 50 million Americans have some type of an immunologic disorder one of the fastest growing markets in the US is immunomodulators. You cannot open the TV without learning about a Tesla or some other immunomodulator drug. And all of that is being put out, but the underlying cause of getting immunologic disorders is not being explained to the general public. So that's a tragedy. Just like the diet heart hypothesis is a tra tragedy, so is the SIBO, and that is such a good question that you asked. Go ahead, sir. When you get your grant and you become your subjects, what's going to happen to us? Well, first, I think we'll do a retrospective study. And I just say, look at uh, data that Dr. Lee and his team have already uh, compiled. And it'll have to be IRB approved, so the University of Houston will have what's called an IRB Institutional Review Board. A bunch of scientists agree that it's a good study, it's worthwhile. And then uh, we'll, we'll see if we can do a retrospective analysis to have this predictive formula. And then maybe, if it's appropriate, we get the right people involved and, and the right um, uh, uh, colleagues to make sure that it's the right thing to do, that we would maybe enroll patients in a prospective study to see if, 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 if they can be uh, uh, this, uh, this index is predictive of, of better <coughs> Is that, is that fair enough, Dr. Yeah, I think so. So in the interest of respecting everybody's time, I'm going to limit to three questions. Uh, after that, I will stay here and talk. And I want to make sure that after the three questions are over, that David does not have anything to say, because he's always very insightful about different things. He's helping us organize the conference. He's volunteering. So go ahead. Two more, please. Otherwise, I'll ask the questions. If you want to bring your so we didn't give a low carb 101, but the question is that when you go on a low carb diet, does it reduce your hemoglobin A1C? And the answer to that is yes. When you eliminate grains, added sugar from your diet, and also remove vegetable oils, so just go back and do just these three things, 
you'll improve your health quite dramatically. All right. Yeah, go ahead. When you guys do the blood tests, can you check for the, uh, the thing that shows you uh, the leaky gut thing? Or I, I, can't, I don't know how to phrase the question. It is the inflammation. So it's the inflammation markers that will tell you whether there is a possibility of leaky gut in addition to the clinical symptoms that you have. So yes, you will check that. All right. Yes, sir, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, uh, vegetable oils uh, started in the 1900s, actually uh, there was a manufacturer called Crisco and they used to make soap and uh, I'll uh, just show you a couple of uh, slides here that kind of shows you. Uh, before that we used to use tallow, soot which is from, uh, from uh, goats and lard and butter. So that's the best way to cook. These are the vegetable oils that are there on the market. The processing of vegetable oils is very chemically intensive. It uses large amounts of heat, it uses solvents like hexene. It is a chemical compound that is not very good for you, it is highly inflammatory. Um, there is a study that was done back in the 1950s and 60s that had already shown because there was a diet heart hypothesis that said eating saturated anim animal fat is bad for you yeah. have vegetable oils and when they did that you can see out there on the slide that people who consumed vegetable oils had a higher incidence of dying compared to people who were left alone to die on the saturated fat that was bad for them the reason vegetable oils is promoted is because back in 1956 American Heart Association which is one of the biggest organizations in the country was a very small organization. It had no money. Procter and Gamble, which was making vegetable oils, gave them one million dollars and their coffers increased like crazy. So to this day, American Heart Association does you disservice by promoting vegetable oils. One of their biggest contributors is Bayer. Bayer is a maker of soybean oil. If you go to their website even today, they talk about vegetable oils being better than saturated fat. Nothing can be further than the truth. And you know, when I say this, I feel uncomfortable because I'm going after my own association. But somebody has to bring them up, bring it to their attention that they are not doing right. I would encourage all of you to listen to Nina Teicholz. She has a beautifully laden story. And if you want to wait and see her in October seminar, I would love it. 